Well, welcome. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about cellular respiration and photosynthesis together in what I'm calling metabolism. And so we're understanding how it is that plant and animal cells work and use all of these cool different functions to be able to do what they need to do. And so in the first two videos, you kind of talked or you learned a little bit about some of the workarounds so that when you don't have all of the necessary materials for cellular respiration or for photosynthesis, there's other things that can happen and still keep the process working. You can still get ATP, you can still get sugars out of it. And so let's just briefly kind of talk a little bit about those or kind of remind ourselves collectively what actually happens. So we know that in certain organisms um, that live in really low oxygen environments or in some cases organisms that don't live in low oxygen environments but find themselves in those situations, they have to be able to deal with it and they deal with it through the process of fermentation. So we know then that all organisms are going to go through this process of glycolysis where we start with glucose, and we go through, we release of course a little bit of ATP and we create this pyruvate. If of course we have some oxygen, that pyruvate is going to go into the mitochondria and go in and do all the remainder of this process of cellular respiration. But if that's not there, then we can actually go through the process of fermentation and specifically be able to recycle that NADH so that we can create more ATP. We know as a byproduct that we're going to be making ethanol or lactate um, through this process as well. And that simply is a byproduct because the whole goal is just to recycle that NADH. And so we know that that's kind of one exception to um, this process of cellular respiration if we don't have oxygen. And that can keep some organisms going for a little bit until they can get oxygen or for some kind of smaller short-lived organisms, that's entirely how they subsist. So if we then kind of take a step back and talk about photosynthesis and, and understand kind of the exceptions or what happens in, in photosynthesis, we understand that in most cases we're going to have that input of CO2 and CO2 is going to come in and get fixed by Rubisco and through the Kelvin cycle it's going to create these sugars. But of course we know in certain situations where maybe the um, the cell is actually flooded with um, either too little CO2 or too much oxygen that what can actually happen is Rubisco unknowingly because it doesn't, it kind of evolved so long ago that it can't really discriminate as well um, and it will just grab this oxygen and when it does that it goes through this process of photorespiration and the bad thing about that is that it kind of wastes things. It wastes carbon through the process of releasing CO2, it wastes ATP and it wastes other resources and it never actually makes the sugar. Um, and so there's two workarounds to kind of avoid this photorespiration. Most plants who do three, C3 photosynthesis um, have to do photorespiration if oxygen levels get too high or CO2 levels get too low. But the two exceptions are C4 plants and CAM plants. And so C4, as you already learned about, um, spatially segregates the Calvin cycle um, and so that it kind of can do the light reaction in a certain cell. Whereas CAM plants are temporally segregating things so the Calvin cycle occurs at night whereas the light reaction is occurring during the day. And so these two different kind of pathways of photosynthesis, the whole goal is to really kind of concentrate the CO2 in the region of the Calvin cycle so that it never actually has to pick up O2 and make um, this extra kind of spin through the photorespiration cycle, but it really focuses in on just the Calvin cycle in producing sugars. And so now we can kind of put some of these ideas together and kind of understand kind of all the pieces that an organism may do. We have this idea of photosynthesis and this idea of cellular respiration. And if we think about ourselves, we clearly know that we are doing cellular respiration. That is a key process is to take the sugars we consume to break them down and to get ATP as our energy. And many of us already know the fact that we, even though it would be wonderful, we cannot do photosynthesis. That is not um, within our capabilities. But one of the kind of real um, questions is what are plants able to do? And so if we have this question, we think about which of the following is true, we should consider, is it that plants are only doing cellular respiration? Is it that plants are only doing photosynthesis? Or are they, are they capable of doing both? Well, many students often think that it's answer B, that plants only do photosynthesis, but that's not actually true. They're actually capable and, and primarily do both cellular respiration and photosynthesis. And we can see that if we just simply look at the cellular level. If we look at a plant and we look at a, it's a plant cell that's shown here, we can clearly see that it has both a mitochondria and chloroplast, which of course are the organelles that are going to be capable of doing both of those processes. So not only do plants need to use sunlight and CO2 
in water to actually make those sugars, they simply need to break them down as well to get the ATP, which they do through cellular respiration in the mitochondria. And of course, we look at animals and we know that they only have that mitochondria to do that cellular respiration and they don't have the capacity through having a chloroplast to do photosynthesis. And so we can clearly understand some differences. But if we just focus in on just those plants, an organism that has both of them, that has the capacity to do both things, and we think about kind of how these processes work together and how they work kind of in concert, we can kind of think about what it is that's actually happening. We know that in photosynthesis, we have these several inputs. We, of course, need light, we need water, and we need CO2. But what if the situation were to arise where CO2 was limited? Okay, even if it was one of those other types of, of pathways, CAM plants or C4 plants. Well, we know that in, in a given situation, if you don't have that CO2, what essentially happens is the Calvin cycle is going to stop. And if we stop doing the Calvin cycle, we simply don't have sugars. And that's clearly not a good thing. So then we think to ourselves, well, what about if we talk about a little bit about this process of cellular respiration? Because we know in cellular respiration, the inputs are things like glucose, in oxygen, okay? Well, if we simply um, deprive a cell or an organism with cells that don't have any oxygen, then we know that we can't do the electron transport chain. But the interesting thing is that these things can actually be linked in several different ways because, of course, if we don't have this oxygen, we can't do electron transport, we can't make ATP, which is very, very crucial. But we could actually keep this process going if we are actually within one particular organism that has both of these um, organelles, both the chloroplast as well as the mitochondria, because we know that the output of photosynthesis is oxygen. So we could actually have that oxygen be contributing to the process of cellular respiration and allowing electron transport chain to actually function. Likewise, we know that an output of cellular respiration is actually CO2. So we could actually take some of that as an output and actually allow the Calvin cycle to go through. And so these things can kind of work together. It doesn't work perfectly in a system, but we know that it is, is certainly um, an important piece. Um, and we also, this also kind of underscores this um, reliance that we have, of course, on plants, because without plants, we would not have this oxygen ever. And so clearly, plants could live in a world without us because they can get by because they have all of this machinery together, whereas we clearly can't work in, in, a, in a world without plants because they are the entirely kind of the, the driver of photosynthesis that is releasing this oxygen as this byproduct, which to us is very, very crucial. And so we can kind of think about that. And if we think a little bit more about some connections between some of these processes, we can kind of ask some questions. So here's kind of a system um, where we have um, both photosynthesis and cellular respiration happening. So we can ask some questions. So say we have, envision that you have a plant. And we take a plant, and it's not aquatic. It usually lives on land. Say maybe it's a sunflower or something like that. And we immerse it in water. Okay, So it's immersed completely in water, has no access to air. If we think about it, what part of photosynthesis would not be able to function? Well, clearly we think about, well, what's in air that the plant actually needs? Well, of course, in the air is carbon dioxide. And so if you actually don't have any carbon dioxide, then this plant actually can't do the Kelvin cycle. And so we know that that could be um, something that could be kind of keeping it going. But if we think, well, in the context of this one plant, it actually has a mitochondria. So what process in cellular respiration could temporarily keep the process going? Well, of course, that would make us think about what process is actually um, releasing CO2. And we can clearly see it's the citric acid cycle is kind of a, a byproduct is releasing the CO2. And so we know that they could be kind of tightly tied in this way. But of course, it's not all kind of um, sunshine and roses, right? Because if that same plant were immersed in water, it's not getting oxygen, and it's not doing photosynthesis, we can also understand that there's probably going to be some impediments to this process of cellular respiration because it's not just CO2 that's in the air, but it's also oxygen, okay? And so if we have a limitation in oxygen, we clearly know that in this case, we're going to not have electron transport chain actually going to be functioning because it's also not going to have that availability um, to kind of have the electrons falling down to that final electron acceptor. 
But of course, we could say, well, what part of the photosynthesis process could actually keep that going? And we know that the, it's the um, light reactions are actually evolving um, oxygen that by breaking this water, and that could actually help keep this going. And so for a limited amount of time, this thing kind of kind of keep itself going, um, but it will eventually kind of um, not keep working. And so that's a good thing to, to know, because we know that essentially what would end up, end up happening is that if it can't keep going, that glycolysis is going to kind of start saying, well, if we don't have any oxygen to kind of drive this electron transport chain, then glycolysis is going to kind of go across and start doing fermentation instead. Um, <clears throat> and of course, that's why you can't dunk a plant and expect it to live for forever, because all of this system after a given period of time is going to break down. But it certainly highlights the fact that there is this kind of real collaboration between these processes of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, which make up this kind of metabolic machinery that we know actually occurs in plants. And we are, of course, reliant upon through our own process of cellular respiration.